This indicator has only given this reading four times in the past 50 years. This basic metal is used as an indicator of S&P strength. We're going to explain why that's most likely not accurate in this current situation. Gold breath is at all time highs. We're going to talk about what that means for gold going forward. Rate cuts are now on the menu. If we take a look at September, we're going to see that there's over a 50% chance by September of not one, but also possibly even two rate cuts. We need to address why the 410 level on the SPY is so significant. There are several leading names we're gonna go over today with key levels and actual max pain levels too that I think are significantly important to watch. Really what we need to do here is look for the names that are breaking out and defying what the market is doing. At the same time, understanding where we are in the economic cycle. Let's get to it. Hey everybody, welcome back. If you're new here, we go over the most actionable information from the week before on Saturdays. And then what we do is focus on how we can utilize that to our advantage to make more informed decisions going into next week. And there was a tremendous amount of information that we need to go over, but let's just drill into the obvious. In front of us is Michigan consumer sediment. The importance of this has been around for some time and we've seen this trade around since about the 50s. Now. What's important about this is the line that I drew right here is right around that 57. Now 57 is where we came in on Friday and that's when the market sold down a little bit. We're gonna address that very shortly. But I think it's important to note a couple things. Number one, if you take this data point and you just look at these particular periods in time and then you look at how we reacted from those periods in time, we can get a better understanding. Now what this is doing is it's giving you an understanding of an extreme reading, meaning this level from a median standpoint is an extreme reading. So to put this in perspective, you go up here to the top, you can see once you get up in these levels, it gets kind of goofy. Highest reading was during the dot com days. And then you can kind of see how we're playing from there. Anything near 100 is pretty goofy. But that just means that everybody's pretty euphoric and everybody's out, you know, making it rain. So then you can see these levels down here. And these are really your pessimistic levels. And this is a really good indicator about how people feel about the economy. And there's a couple really important things to note here. So the very first thing is before we get into what happens at these readings, this 80, 81, they're calling it 80, 95 from peak to trough, taking the average, that's your average reading going back from the 1950s. So if we understand the average that we can understand why 57 is so amazing as, as far as dropping off a cliff, and why 105 is just absolutely insane. You can see this pretty clearly just by looking at it. Now, we should point out this was the lowest reading on record and it happened in 22. We've never had a reading that low. And that just shows where we were in regards to the state of the economy. I also think this lets us know that people might be panicking a little bit more than they should. And that's something that we're gonna have to watch. Now, if we overlay these four levels on the S&P, this is our first reading in 1980. Right in here, you can see how we rallied up from there. And then we just continued to push. This becomes an extreme reading. Now, we never really got below that level. But I think it's important to note that you just did not go straight up. You came all the way back down. So this is definitely something that we need to watch and definitely something that we need to pay attention to. The second time that we were in this reading, you can see it right here, the arrow. There's another little arrow right there, but right in this little group. Now, it didn't automatically just stop, nor am I suggesting that that's what happens. But it does start meaning that we're getting to a level that's a little bit silly. And you can see the same exact thing that happened here. And I think that's important to note that it doesn't mean that you're at a bottom, but it does mean that you may be bottoming. And I think that that's an important distinction, right? So while, while we're not getting and saying, oh, this is the bottom, what we're saying is this area right here, you might be forming something and that's something that we're gonna wanna pay attention to. Now, what's interesting about this last reading, which took place right there, is we never really got below there. We did the undercut of the H and then we kind of bounced from this piercing pattern and we've been going higher ever since. Now, the next time we have this reading is right here. So I'm not suggesting that we're just going to simply stop, but I think that you have to look at this for what it is. And that when you see an extreme reading like that, that could be signaling some kind of flush. Now, before we go any further, it's important to understand where we are in the economic cycle. You had a lot of data that came out this week. 
So we have to understand where we are in the economic cycle, right? CPI came down at 4.9%. There was only a 21% chance it was going to break five and it did. And that's a reading that we haven't had in two years. PPI gave us a reading it hasn't had in two years. So inflation is coming down. That's just a fact. And we're seeing that in the bond market. And we're also seeing it in the Fed rate decisions, which we will address in a moment here. But if we take a look at this, we know we're coming in. So what part in the economic cycle when inflation comes down are we seeing? Well, what we're seeing is that basic materials will start to come in. Okay, that's just a fact. Basic materials will start to come in as inflation wanes. It's just the way that it is. It's always been that way and it's because of demand. And that's what's important about it. Now, we know where we are in the economic cycle, which is pretty clear, right? And we can all see that since inflation has been dropping, you've been kind of bonking around in here, demand, not demand, but you can see this wedge fairly clearly. And we're pretty overextended here on materials. I mean, I don't think anybody would disagree with that. If you kind of look at a major support level for materials, you could, you could get all the way back to 64 quite easily. A matter of fact, you even had a downgrade of a SCCO this week by Goldman. So they're starting to see cracks in copper as well, which we're about to address. But we need to understand where we are in the cycle. So when we start seeing materials, we start seeing energy come in, we start seeing the cuts. The cuts are a race, just so you understand this. OPEC is racing to cut production faster than the Fed's going to cut rates. And quite frankly, they're ahead of the Fed right now. So if you see this, and you can see why we're coming down, it doesn't matter how much demand you think is for oil out there or the strategic reserve. At this stage in the game, what Michigan Consumer Sentiment is telling you what energy is telling you is that inflation is coming down and people are going to start getting a little concerned. Now, whether this turns into a recession or not, that's not the debate of this video. The debate of this video and the purpose of it is to give us actionable information that we can act on next week. Make sure that you get the newsletter as well. It's free. There's a link in description. I put out 20 charts today that you need for next week, the most important charts. So if you look at how this is going right now, okay, we can clearly see that energy is coming in and we can clearly see that materials are coming in. So we know we're in an, an environment where inflation is clearly coming down. It is not even really open for debate anymore. Now, one of the favorite tools that I see used a lot and I see it used incorrectly is copper. A lot of people look at copper and say, well, as copper drops, so does the stock market. Okay. So if we take a look at this theory, and we look at it on a much longer term time frame. We can see up here it's five. And then we can come up here and you see about a year later, we're sitting around 440. So we're down, right? And we can all see that we're down. And then we can see January. And then from January, we can see how the market is just dropping, right? So copper is just absolutely imploding. This is a monthly chart. Now, if we take a look at 2023, we will see the huge rise in the beginning of the year just absolutely rips. And then that is pretty much the end of it. And it drops the entire time. If we look at the market as a whole and say, well, did we do the same thing? Well, no, we really didn't do the same thing. Here we are, 2023, right? And then we kind of ran the same way that copper ran. But then as copper dropped, what happened? Well, the market just kept pushing higher and we kept making these higher lows. And I think that is something that is really significant that people have to remember. The market will tell you what it's going to do. You just have to have a little bit of patience, right? You don't really want to go out there and predict. You might want to make some bets on what you think may happen ahead of time. I do that sometimes. But at the end of the day, we need to understand what's happening and why this is happening. So if we look at what we're supposed to be using as a guide, which is supposed to be the HG1, which is what I'm just using, which is the futures market on copper. This clearly is not something that I am going to use or feel comfortable in an environment where basic materials are supposed to come down. And if basic materials are supposed to come down, who does that benefit? Well, I think that's the, the question that people aren't really asking. And we're going to get into that right now. It benefits the NASDAQ. Now, why does it benefit the NASDAQ? Now, you're going to notice this, and a lot of people are not talking about this, but there is a, a huge differentiation here between what the NASDAQ does and what copper does. Well, the NASDAQ as a whole, semiconductors, you need certain basic materials. I'm just using copper as an example, but you need certain basic materials to build semiconductors. If the cost of those materials drop, 
the gross margins of semiconductor companies go up. If you take a look, I'm not going to go all the way back, but if you take a look from here from March and you look and going all the way to May in the past two months, we'll go back a little further. So we'll go actually go back to January. So if we go back to January, and we just take a look at this as copper prices have dropped, the Nasdaq's going higher. So if your underlying cost to build your product, no matter who, what business you're in, whether you, you make a widget, if your costs drop because basic material costs drop, well, your profit margins go up, right? So I look at this and this is one of the ways that I use it. And I think it's an inverse correlation. The NASDAQ is not going to care. Semiconductor companies are going to care, but the NASDAQ as a whole is not going to care. Cloud computing could care less about what copper is doing. Now that segues into our next two topics. Number one, it's not just materials that are come in, it's gold that will start to come in as this gets worse. And I just want to point out something. This is GDX breadth. It's a percentage of stocks above the 200 day, and this is a very long term indicator. Now, 100 is about as great as you can get because that means every GDX stock is above its 200 day moving average. That's probably not realistic to stay like that forever. And if we take a look at that, it doesn't usually stay that way forever. If you take a look at this peak here, and let's take a look at this for a moment. If you take a look at this peak right here and you come across, you can all see that that's a high, right? You can also see how it, it marks these extreme levels. Zero is probably not a reading that's sustainable, meaning that names are going to be below that. But if you look at this where you're at when you're at 100, it's pretty glaring that you're putting a top in in gold. And here we are again. And I think that's a pretty important distinction that people need to be aware of. When you're in this 100 range, uh, there's just really nowhere to go. It doesn't really mean that you're going to go and find yourself in a position where it's going to collapse. But if you are a betting person and you're looking at this, you would have to assume that we're probably at the tail end of this. Now, that leads us to our next topic. We have to focus on what's going on with the Fed. Now, we have the debt ceiling. I'm just going to come out and say it. I don't think we're going to default on debt, but nothing would surprise me but I just don't see it. We saw this in 11. It is what it is. They're going to debate and posture. But if we go out to the June meeting and we should really look at all these, if we go out to the June meeting and we look at the probabilities out there, what we're going to see is that there's an 85% or 84.5% probability that they're going to leave rates just where they are. And then 525, 550, there's a 15% chance of a rate increase. And we're going to talk about the banking industry and why I just don't think that's what's going to happen. But I do think that it's important that we we talk about it. So going through this is really important. So in other words, what we're looking at is, OK, so this with the data we have now, what are they predicting? Well, this is where we're at. OK, current target range is right here. They're saying the target range may drop to here. Well, this implies a Fed cut. That's twenty nine point three percent chance of a Fed cut that this range dropping to this range. So now we have a 30 percent chance of a Fed cut and a 10% chance of a rate hike. Very rare to see this, but here it is. Now you go into September and what you're going to start seeing is, well, this is where we're at. This is our current range. Well, now there's a 50% chance or 48.1% chance of one rate cut and a 17% chance of two rate cuts. So if you're to average these two together, you have the majority of people think in September you have your first rate cut. Now, I don't think it's going to happen in June. I certainly don't think they're going to do July. I think they're going to level these out. And that's good for us in equities because it just gives us that sweet spot of where the Fed is doing nothing and we don't have to worry about the Fed as much. Now, you go out to November and you start realizing that only 6% think that the market is going to be at the same rate it is now. And now we have 16% chance of three rate cuts by this particular period in time. 45% two rate cuts, one rate cut, 31%. So when you start to look at this and you really drill into it and you watch how these numbers are moving, it is very clear that in a couple months, it is predicted that we are going to be talking about rate cuts, not rate hikes, not pauses. Now, who will bear the brunt of this? Well, the brunt of it is going to be bared by the 10 year. People will be buying the 10 year. And now we're starting to see that we're even having trouble with that 350 level. But with these kinds of cuts coming, you should start to see this move. Now, with this debt limit talk, this 333 level, I don't know that we're going to break it because people are saying, well, I'm afraid to own bonds right now because I think they're going to default on debt. 
I think this is one of the more crazy charts. This is the 20 year. And what you're seeing here is just, you are just absolutely unable to break this level. It just does not happen at all. And I don't know why it's not happened. This 108.55. I don't really know why people aren't buying the long end. We're starting to see them kind of step up with it. But this is really, you know, the tail that wags the dog. I mean, this, this should be moving and it's just, it's not doing that. Also, this is putting a little bit of stress on the one month because people are looking at this going, well, do I really want to own a one month bond? Do I really want to be buying the one month right now? Because if they're going to default, they're going to default on the one month, right? So you might be in that situation where you're looking at this going, well, do I really want to own that? And the answer is a lot of people are saying, no, I don't. We saw this massive move uh, when it came out, when Yellen came out and said, oh, by the way, uh, it might be sooner than later that we will default. To me, it's all gamesmanship, but you are seeing some signs of this where you start to see a little bit of panic. Now, if you start looking at that panic, well, the regionals are kind of in a, a pickle because they can't really go out on the 10 year anymore, right? Because they don't want to lever to it because of what's been happening, even though now might not be the worst time in the world to be buying the 10 year. So now they're skittish. Now, if they were buying ultra short term, like one month and just trying to make it through, well, now that's going against them. So they're not able to lever their, their bond portfolios at all. They certainly can't lever before we know what's going on here. Now, what we're seeing is this is the pandemic level low. This would get us to that 27. We closed at a new weekly low. And I just want to point out something. It's not mattering how solid these banks are anymore. And that's where I start getting concerned. And I'm getting concerned as somebody that is long some of these banks. And I'm going to go through a couple of the ones I'm long that I like long term. But I'm looking at this. And one of the core problems that I'm running into is at this level, when you're up here, okay, you still are overweight from this level, regionals and portfolios. In other words, from right here to here, people still had more on, right? And that's a problem because they're looking at it and going, do I really want to be long regionals? Like this is not working. And it's just a question of what are they going to do to fix it? And we start looking at these names like PACW, and you guys will remember, I went through the uh, the FRC, we went through a bunch of them, but my point with FRC is we were just pretending that it's not a big deal that a regional bank is down 90, 95% and just sitting there. Well, here we go again, and, there, and, and these comments that came out, oh, by the way, we're fine for a year. Well, you're fine for a year if people don't pull money out of your bank. Okay, they're losing 10% a week again. So we're going to lose this bank. I mean, I just think it's a matter of time. Nobody's going to buy them. They're going to buy the assets. If you read the headlines today, Yellen's already coming out and saying she wants more mid-tier bank consolidation. Now that's speak for, I don't want JP Morgan buying another bank, right? I mean, nobody wants JP Morgan to get any bigger than it is. They just don't want that to happen. And you're seeing JP Morgan start to get a little weaker here on the weekly, and you can see how we're rejecting that level. But these are important distinctions that we need to make. So that is another pickle, right? And the debt, the debt limit, that's becoming a problem for us, but we're gonna have to figure that part of the problem out. But for now, what I'm noticing more than anything is over and over again, no matter what the name is, they're having a problem. Now, before we get into individual names, I just wanna point out something. You're having a real issue here with this 410 level. And there's a reason for it. And I think it's worth talking about, but you're constantly trying to get over it or under it. And you're just having this huge battle. And I think it's really important for us to kind of discuss why this is happening and why this could alleviate after the options expiration. In front of us is the option data. And this option data is pretty clean, right? We should be able to just walk through this, but here we are, here's 410. And this is expiring on the 19th. Now, to the right are puts, to the left are calls. Now, if you look at this and you look at that 410 level and you start seeing this huge level between 410, 411, 412, right? And you start really studying what's going on here, 413. Okay, where are they gonna get hurt the most option market makers? Okay, they don't wanna pay this, right? They definitely do not wanna pay this. If you look over here, they're gonna pay significantly less if you're under 410. So we're gonna to have to watch that 410 level really closely this week. Because if I was an option market maker, I'd be doing everything in my power to not pay these people. And that's exactly what they do. So they can come out and put pressure on the market via net short, net long, 
and that's what they tend to do. So watch 410 on the S&P this week. I think it's worth noting where we are on the panic euphoria chart, that we are once again extremely pessimistic. The best moves out of this panic euphoria are when we break down and then we break back over. Now, if we zoom in on this, let's just go to a three year and you can see how they just keep walking this down as the panic and the panic continues. But look at where we are down in 2012-23 right before Christmas and then how we exploded in January over and then we just pushed right into February and then peaked back down. But we're starting to see a change here and we should talk about it. So we're seeing this obviously was euphoria and the peak, we're all gonna make money forever. And then you start seeing how we drop. Now, if you start looking at these levels and these crosses, it gets pretty obvious what's going on here when you start seeing the crosses that don't hold, but you see the really extreme levels, right? But what we're noticing is higher lows. You're getting higher lows. You've not been getting higher lows before. And that is a change in trend. So whenever we see a change in trend like that, I wanna pay attention to it. Okay, that's pretty significant to me. So I wanna watch that change in trend that I'm seeing in the panic euphoria model, because if we start making higher highs, well, that means that we could start seeing a push towards the upper band. I think we're far away from people feeling ecstatic about this market, but if we can come off this level and start pushing higher, that's good for equities. In front of us is growth relative to value. Why this is important is it just lets us know where are people placing their bets. Right now they're buying growth, and this is all market caps. But if we take a look at this, you start looking down at these levels, I mean, it's pretty glaring what's going on. So this was your pre-pandemic level of growth versus value, and we got to that trough level, and then from there you can see the explosion, and now you're trying again and you're pushing. This is a really clear breakout that people are leaning very, very clearly towards growth versus value. This is obviously a weekly chart, but growth cycles, growth cycles that lead, in other words, growth cycles from a low that move to a nine month high. So you had a 24 month relative low to a nine month high. They tend to outperform. Now, it doesn't mean you're gonna go up right away. Understand that what sediment trader is saying here is that this is a long-term chart, right? This is your out years. But what they're seeing is the same thing that I'm saying. You're seeing a lot of people that were extremely pessimistic or that are now buying growth names. Even in the IWM, which is lagging, you can see here, this is growth versus value just in small cap names. Even the IWM that's lagging, we're still even seeing small cap growth outperform. And go back here and take a look at this, and you realize that, okay, yep, historically, over many years, we're nowhere near the high of growth versus where we're supposed to be. But if you just take a step back and you say over 52 weeks, okay, growth is outperforming, and we're seeing that. Growth continues to outperform value in small cap. If you like how we went through the S&P and how we looked at the option data, let me know, that's something that I can do. I'm not trying to turn this into an options course, but these kinds of levels, this is pretty significant stuff. And I, we all know how the option market makers trade. They don't wanna be in this. But if you'd like to start seeing this kind of information on individual names, max pain levels, start understanding what the market makers are thinking, options, just comment below and I can start including those levels when we start going through individual names. Now, I go over some of these individual names in greater detail in the newsletter. Again, link in description to get the newsletter. So if you see right here, and we take a look at Tesla, and we're gonna go through some names here and some key levels that you need to watch, you're unable to close above that 200 week moving average. That's not where you wanna be. So the concern now is that Elon is going to get a CEO for Tesla. I, I don't know if he is or not. That's why we started to see it sell down a little bit. That and the recall out of China. I, I really have no idea what he's going to do. All I can tell you is what I see. We are below the 200 week. If we take a look here and we see this level, this should be a concern of ours. Now you are in this little bit of a training range. Always clone these because it gets you the same trajectory and you want the same trajectory because that tells you most likely where the channel is. So then you're starting to see this and this is becoming problematic. I think that the RSI needs to break over that 50 level and it's just having a really tough time doing it, and that's not where you wanna be. You don't wanna be this guy. You don't wanna be in a situation where you're constantly trying to break over that 50 RSI, and you're just struggling with it. Now you can see how on the weekly here, this gave us a real clear indication of a bottom, but I need to get over that 50 line, and I'm really struggling with it. Google had an absolutely massive week. It just saw really no signs of breaking down. 
pretty clear with why saying the magic two letters, AI, AI, but what we're really seeing here is we're seeing that final breakout, that final turn. We've been battling this level for years in here and we're finally starting to get through. And I think that's pretty important. So now we can see our level pretty clear, right? What's going on right in here, right? We can see the RSI is up and we can see the push. We're gonna to wanna to watch this next week. This did get a little frothy, but I, to me it looks amazing. And I think we have to watch that 123 level. Disclaimer, I have a position on in this. I really don't plan on doing anything with it. I've just constantly been adding to it. it the strength on, on Friday was pretty impressive, frankly. Disney's loss is Netflix's gain. Now, didn't have the follow through, but that was due to the Michigan Consumer Survey just skin the heck out of everybody. But all we really did was just pull back to the bottom of this level and break out. I'd be really careful giving up on NVIDIA, or I'm sorry, on Netflix here. Zooming in here, you're gonna notice a couple key levels. Number one, you're unable to close below that level. Number two, look at the RSI. The RSI is telling you that you're probably gonna push here. Now, what I wanna make sure of for those long-term investors is you just don't wanna break that low. You do not wanna break the low of that bar. That's not where you wanna be. And I think that's like 322. So you're gonna to have to figure out how you're gonna get in there and how much of a, how much room you're gonna give it. I, I'm not giving anything 20 points, I'm not in this kind of market. Maybe in a breakaway market I would, but we're obviously not in one. Meta is struggling with the 200 week moving average. Now we struggled here and here with it as well. Flipped it here, looked like we were gonna go, but we got that failed breakout, right? We got that failed push on it. And now we're wrestling it. And this is not where you wanna wrestle it when you have a weekly RSI that's at 80. Now, if you take a look at this, I'll explain why. If we go and take a look at when was the last time that you had an RSI of 80, and then it comes back down and breaks that level. I did that whole RSI video on this. It doesn't mean that you're going to you know, fall apart. It does mean that you might need a break. So if you start going through the level that we're talking about, and I'm not even gonna go back to 17, we'll just go back five years and go, okay, every single time that we break that level, what happens? We get over to 80 and then we break under 70. Okay, well, there's one, here's another, right? And these, this is a weekly chart, so please understand that this takes weeks, doesn't take just a Tuesday. But you see, you're still going sideways and rebuilding and working it off. And then of course you have the major rip here at the end that just marked the all time high. But here we are again. So do we really wanna be getting crazy up here? I like the name. I'd be very interested in the name if it could work this off. I just don't see us being able to work it off just yet. And on a daily chart, 236.60 is becoming a major problem. So we, this is where we broke down, tried to get over. That's where we closed above. And now we just keep bumping up in here over and over again. And that's not where we want to be. I'm just, it's just not. We want to be flipping that level. And right now we're battling it. NVIDIA continues to battle that 290.57. I have a long position in the SOX SOXL. I like semiconductors a lot here, but I'm not really breaking out. Matter of fact, I keep fighting this level and I'll show you a couple things in here that are somewhat, I won't say bothersome, but don't make me you know, feel that great. Now, if we look at the hourly, we'll notice a couple things here and I wanna drill into this and then drill into some smaller time frames. But you see how this lower low, then a lower low, then a lower low, right? Like, I'm not crazy about that. So I am, I am watching it. I think you have to really look at this a couple different ways. Like, where are you gonna to get to? Maybe 272. Do you really wanna be the guy that's out there trying to short this? Let's talk about that and how that's going. So if you take a look at being short these kinds of names, I mean, you basically have to sell directly into the rip and then just hope that you get bad economic data and that it breaks down. I mean, that was the entire move. If you waited for the news to come out on Michigan Consumer, by the time it hit, you're at 230. 283, 36, and then where does that put you by the end of the day? I mean, you'd have to time these perfectly. But if we drill into this five, what I notice is I'm starting to see a pattern that I'm not overly crazy about. And you can start to see it as well. It keeps hitting this level, rejection, rejection, rejection. So maybe we need to go sideways for a while. Maybe it needs to work this off. That is a possibility. I do like the socks. I do like the SOXL here but I always have to look at what's going on and I'll show you an indicator that I use and I find it extremely helpful. I take a 15 minute chart 
And then what I do is I take that 15 minute and then I overlay a three, a five and an eight with it from the daily. And then it gives me an understanding of how they're acting at those levels. Now, there's a couple things here. I'm kind of bonking around, right? So am I breaking down? Yeah, you're breaking a little bit. This five is starting to point down. I don't like when that points down. I don't even really care as much that it's under as much as that five starts pointing down. Because you start looking at that and going, well, when, when was the last time the five pointed down, right? Well, you really haven't had the five pointing down since here. And that gave us a couple weeks, right? Or a couple days of just sideways action. So I think we really have to watch that. But if we clean all that off and we just look at the pricing, you could pretty easily get to 272 if this got ugly. You could get there. Now, I don't know that we are getting there, but it's, it's definitely a distinct possibility and we have to be aware of that. This 280 level has a lot of interest. So I'm not sure it happens, but we have to be cognizant of this and we have to look at this and say, yeah, that, that is a possibility and that's something that we wanna focus on. Similar with AMD, we saw this huge run into 99. Now 99 on AMD is an absolutely huge level. Let's click over here and drop it that way, perfect. So if we look at this, let's go back to the weekly. So if we look at the weekly, we see that 99 level, we're just unable to break. We can't get anywhere with it, bonk, 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 right? But you are trying, you are reversing here. What I do not like is I do not like all this selling followed by this green bar. I would like to have had more, but baggers can't be choosers. It is what it is. I also don't like that these are lower highs, every single one of them. And I don't like that we didn't close near the high end. So could we need a breather here? You could, I mean, it wouldn't be the worst thing in the world to take a breather. And I just wanna point this out. You're Again, you're hitting these lower highs. Now, this is from somebody that's long semiconductors. Now, not everything I do is going to work. I have to be aware of that cognizant and that's why you have stop losses, right? You have to honor them. So I don't know that we're gonna break down. And I'm trying to give it patience because I think that the NASDAQ is actually going to continue to lead here, and I'll show you why in a moment, but I wanna go through some more of these names because there's some significant moves out there. Now, I wanna talk about NVIDIA and just give you one key level. You see this 272, that's where you could break. You have a doji up here on a weekly chart against a major resistance level. Your level that you need to make sure that you're holding is the low of that doji. The low of that doji is 280.46. 280.46. So if you're trading NVIDIA and you're long, that's your drop dead. You need to watch that because if you break that doji, you have an outside week and then you can easily get to that 272.31. I just mapped out the whole trade for you right there. Now I'd be remiss in not stating that I am long IEP. I like IEP a lot here. Now I have a long position and I have puts married to it. If I was short, I would be very concerned. The borrow rate on the short is up to 20% and you're paying out uh, roughly 25% dividend. That means the people that are short this currently are at a deficit of 46% per annum, meaning they need 46% on their short to break even from this level. And just to kind of put that where you would be, if you start taking, say, I'm short here and I need 46%, well, 46% is going to put you right around here. Uh, you're basically saying that it's going to trade under its net asset value of the parts at this point, if that's your bet. That's probably not the best idea. So I think you have a lot of people that got, as I refer to it, hindenburg and that what they're going to wind up doing is realizing that maybe this isn't the brightest idea to short one of the top investment managers in the world in the past five decades that maybe he's gonna know a little bit more than the short sellers and how to play around with them. You can go back and look what he did to Herbalife, absolutely destroyed Ackman. To this day, he still talks about it. Ackman still talks about it, so it cost him billions. So do you think he's going to act favorably to someone that's attacking his company? The answer is he's probably not. Now, what is he going to do? I don't have a clue, but I know this. I know I'm getting $8 a year. I know he's not cutting the dividend anytime soon, and I did protect myself with puts. Why I'm bringing this trade up again is, I think this is pretty significant. So there's this rumor floating around that Hindenburg actually copied part of this report. I don't know if that's true or not. It's gonna start unwinding and I'm sure it's getting picked up. I know it's getting picked up on Reddit right now and I know it's getting picked up on 4chan. So I try not to laugh about it, but what does this mean? It means that you should probably pay attention to this name because right now you're getting about a 25% dividend 
while this tries to sort itself out. And at the same time, you buy some puts and the puts are cheap. So you, it's up to you what you want to do here. But I would not be out there trying to short this. If I was short this and I saw this kind of action, I'd be very concerned. The very first concern I would have is gaps down and then gaps up, okay? Then it gaps down and I get a small island reversal there. That would not make me feel warm and fuzzy being short. So this 3962 is where you wanna see how you're gonna go and you can see the significance of that level. I actually am gonna link a video at the end of this. If you are struggling with day trading, I think the video is eight or nine minutes long. Watch this video. I literally walk through my trade on this where we took five or six dollars out of the trade. I walk through it line by line with timestamps and live trading. So it's impossible to not get the concept. And I would strongly suggest that you flip it on, watch it, and if you're running low on time, put it on double speed or save it for later. But if you look at this level and what's going on here, do you really wanna be that guy? And then you just start going out there and just put the, well, let's put the most minor of things out there. Let's just put like a nine EMA and see how that's going for a moment, right? Okay, so now we're, we have our first close over the nine EMA. That might be something that we wanna pay attention to. So let's say that you don't like EMAs, and let's just go out there and make this a five and just go look at an SMA and see how we're doing there. Okay, well, now we closed over, under, back over the five SMA, and we can always just drop this into our three level and just kind of see how we're doing. Well, that's kind of interesting, isn't it? So now we're constantly above the three, we're constantly above the eight, and we're constantly above the five, and if it just stays here, these are gonna start curling up and maybe give us a shot at that 39.87. There is a ton of information in this video. There are parts that you're probably gonna to wanna to watch more than once. If you find value in these videos, I spend a lot of time on them and I would really appreciate if you share them on social media. Even if a couple people that follow you watch it, it's really important to me that people actually understand what's going on and learn instead of me just sitting here and pointing things out. So my goal is to educate, and when it is shared, it is helpful and it is noticed. So I do appreciate it. Now, if you see these levels right here, this is the NASDAQ versus the SPY. And the reason that I'm showing you this is, this looks exactly like growth versus value. So we're seeing where the money is going, right? We're seeing that, we're seeing it be chased. And I just wanna go through this level so that you can see where you're at, right? It takes you, carries you straight across, and now you're starting to push up. Do not roll out the NASDAQ because the S&P is going sideways. I know the S&P is extremely frustrating to people, especially swing traders right now. Please comment on this video in the format. It's greatly appreciated. There is a button right here to just click and that will take you to the newsletter. I'll sign up for it, it's coming out daily and it's packed with information. Have a great day guys. Thanks for watching.